So welcome to the Up Level Podcast, Rich Jones. I am so excited to be here. There aren't many people that I can have the type of conversation that we're probably going to have today. So I'm just, I can't wait to get into it. Let's get it cracking. Let's get it cracking. Well, the context uh, is we're in the season of the ROI of coaching in the workplace. And that's how you and I met through uh, coach training in the workplace. And I've had the great honor of watching you over the past few years expand your leadership as you've developed yourself as a coach, used it inside your organization, and um, shared the tools with others. So I thought, Rich Jones has to be here. He has to come and, and share some of these lived experiences. And you're also using coaching to expand belonging in the workplace, which is such an important conversation today. Um, and I know there's some cool things that you're using for it outside of the workplace that I hope we get into as well. Yeah, I am a open book. So let's talk about whatever. Looking forward to hopefully sharing some insights that the audience can take away. And I'm also in a season personally of accepting my capacities to, to get things done, but also appreciating what has been done. I think I had a moment recently where I kind of I kind of accepted that I'm doing way too much right now. And I'd beat up on myself for a minute. But then on the other side of it, I looked at what I wrote down and I was like, man, I've been doing a lot. Like this is more than any, like I've been sustaining at a level that like the average person would think I was nuts if I was, if I was doing this. So I'm also in a mode of deep reflection too. So yeah. I'm sure that'll come in handy today. That will definitely come in handy. Well, and actually let's talk about how coaching, you being coached, you coaching, you knowing this methodology, how is that serving you to create these different aspects of your mission? I think it shows up primarily in my thoughtfulness. I think my ability to listen, my ability to empathize, uh, even something as simple as sharing at work that folks are creative, resourceful, and whole. A lot of people on my team had never heard that before. And I've said that to a couple of folks and, and it really resonated with them. So a lot of it is just me like naturally living it out. I'm not going around using formal terms. And, and I mean, if someone asked me something specifically, or for example, I have a coaching framework that I'm working on for the day job. But for me, it's really about just, just living it out. I feel like I've been doing that since I attended the co-active sessions that you facilitated at Google, where even I still have that sheet of paper from the end of the session where everyone shared their hopes for me and uh, names. And, I, and there were some other specifics that I'm, that I'm blanking on, but I still reference that where the top word or name was the CEO. And then I remember, th and I remember, and this was probably 2018, 2019 or something like that, that the season that I was in then is a completely different season versus the one that I'm in now. And in that season, people were asking for me to show more of what I'm actually showing now. Yeah. So it's been kind of crazy to see that too, where people like, like lean into it, boldness, speak up. These are all things that, that people wrote down for me. And they're things that I'm now leaning directly into. I just uh, full body shivers because it's so true. Like watching you grow, um, find more balance, right? Your company and you, growing your podcast, the different types of content that you're creating to really serve people. It's, it's so true. And coaching does such a good job of helping leaders, humans. This is how I define leader. If you're a human, you're a leader. If you're a leader, you're a human, right? This is what we're doing here on planet Earth. Um, vision into what's what is their potential and coaches can be that witness that reflector back that mirror back of this is who I see you to be and then you're a great example of I've grown into this the the way my colleagues my coaches were holding me in 2018 here we are in 2024 and it's like it's happening so that's um that's a great ROI of coaching, right? It expands the human, expands the leader. Uh, another, another massive ROI, and I, I alluded to it, is 
I got to create, or I'm in the process of creating a coaching framework for my team at the day job. And it's influenced by some of the coactive principles, like for example, even things around the levels of listening. That has been, for the type of work that I do, where it's, I'm primarily one-to-one with other employees, helping them navigate challenges, being able to listen deeply and get to the root of what the actual issue is, sometimes because it's not what the person is saying directly to us. And so being able to listen and then reflect back and then have the person go, oh, actually, you know what? No, it's not that. It is. I hadn't even thought about that before. And so having moments like that, that creates a feeling of of personal value. And so being able to even share something like that with the team as a result of what I as a result of what I've learned, it's positioned me as an internal coaching expert within within my team and and in some ways within my org, because other folks know that I'm working on this on this, too. And I've had someone ask me if I could do a workshop for another region globally. And it's not the season for that because of how much is going on. But yeah. I find that the the practices, the principles, walking the talk is serving me really well. And the I feel like the ROI is, is just beginning. Hmm. How do you define coaching? Just for folks who are maybe newer to this concept and or they're... Um, they're listening in from their organization thinking, should I make this investment in bringing coach training in for leaders and coaching for employees? How do you define it, Rich? It's about helping people discover their own answers and empowering them along the way. Because my job is part coaching, part consulting. And there are a lot of folks, even just generally, there are a lot of folks who think anyone who's spewing advice, not spewing, spewing has a negative connotation, but anyone who's giving advice on social media and says they're a coach, they're coaching. But the truth is coaches spend a lot more time listening and asking questions and getting people to introspect and getting people to think about what they actually, actually want and giving spokes and giving folks the space and container to be themselves and to, and to share what's on their mind, even with the, even something like designing an alliance. That's not something people don't naturally do something like that, but it's, it's something that's immensely helpful, whether you're in a coaching context or you're just building, you're building a relationship to start a new project at work. You're about to have a guest come on your, your podcast. But even something as as simple as that has been immensely helpful in my ability to create relationships, but also to avoid and navigate challenges later on, because we've already agreed up front how we're going to handle conflict, how we're going to handle difficulties as, as they come up. So I feel like it's even led to projects running smoother and where there could have been a potential conflict, I slash slash we have been able to navigate around it because of the principles once again. I think um, Designed Alliance is probably my favorite concept from uh, coactive coaching um, training to what you're saying. The amount of drama (laughs) that I've been able to avoid because it doesn't matter what context I'm in. Like if it's with a doctor, a real estate agent, um, my life partner, my business partner. And like you said, before you start a coaching relationship or before a project starts with different um, colleagues, this concept can really help us all align on what does success look like? Who, um, how do we bring out the best in each other as we move this forward? How do we want to be with each other during tough moments? Because we know that they're going to happen. This is, this is the times we are living in, right? <laughs> there's going to be, there's going to be challenges. So like, it doesn't mean we have it all figured out before we get going. But if at least we've established that when things kind of go off the rails, we can say, hey, I remember you said it was important for us to uh, speak in private with feedback or in a tough conversation. So you remember that and you honor that and that builds trust, right? Which means then you can keep designing that alliance, deepening the relationship, moving forward human to human as you do the work. Yes. 
And as we're talking about this, I'm realizing it might be my favorite too, because it's probably one of the top three things, not probably, it is one of the top three things that I recommend to folks at work when they're having issues with their manager. Or if they're looking to reset, because a lot of times they haven't done that to start. And so now the, the, the communication's off, the, the trust is lost. Each person's making up narratives about each other because they haven't actually had a conversation. So I think, especially when you start a new role or you get a new manager or it's a new performance season or, or quarter, those are fantastic times to say, hey, you know what? I want to reset and talk about how we work together. And that's, and that's the thing. You don't have to, it's not like if you didn't do it at the beginning and you're hearing this now that you can't do it. Right. It, it's it. You could yeah. say I heard this on a podcast. Yes. <laughs> that you you yes. could say anything to intro to introduce it to the conversation, and and I think what people don't understand is that because managers don't really do this either. People, I, I've never had a people, and I and I've had some good people managers, but I've never had a people manager do this. That just by, just not I can't, I can't say this for every single manager, but in most cases, when someone comes with that level of thoughtfulness. It it kind of it kind of takes them aback a little bit because it's like wow no one's ever no one's ever I like approached me that way before or no one has leaned into the relationship that way before and it signals partnership or or a a willingness to partner which is absolutely critical. It is, and I know part of your work is really focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So, how would you say coaching? the skills, the concepts, the context supports creating an environment of belonging? I'd say it's the universalness of it. The fact that I can talk to anyone around the world. And of course, there'll be some cultural differences depending on what the region is, but I, I can talk to anyone around the world and everything that we've talked about so far and things that we're probably going to talk about will apply. And so I have a, it's a standard start to every meeting with a client. It's a standard set of, of tools that I could apply from. So not, I'm not expending, uh, extra energy, uh, trying to figure out things and how do I approach this? No, I already know how I'm going to approach this. I know I'm going to be kind. I'm going to listen, et cetera. And I think it really gives people a space to feel heard. There are, particularly in the workplace, there are a lot of employees across differences who, who have the same challenge. The way that, what I'm hearing, the way that it helps is that it creates universality because it's a, it's a really a language of human, <laughs> the human language that creates belonging. It's, it's right, it's a way of, it's not only like a set of skills and concepts, but it's a way of being which really supports working with folks from, like you said, all different regions, all different identities. Yes. And that idea of having a space to, to be heard, a space to just be seen, I think that's a massive part of it. For example, yes. I was recently talking to someone who was neurodivergent and the conversation that I was able to have with them, I think there was an initial, I can relate to this person so much and and my nature and the way that my ADHD sometimes shows up is I want to just like interrupt and and jump in and be like, oh, me too. And oh, do you, do you get, do you experience this? Do you experience that? Do you, but that's, that's taking the shine off of the client and in some ways bringing it back to myself. So even in a situation like that, being able to no, like my, like, my, like my primary goal is to listen. What we've agreed is that I'm going to spend the bulk of this meeting listening and that if I need to interrupt, I'll, I'll write it down or I'll use the raise hand feature or something like that to, to jump in. But it's really about the individual and being curious about the individual. And I find people, people really appreciate that. There are a lot of folks who feel like they, they don't have that space to, to be heard. Uh, and, th and that's across backgrounds and then across demographics. There's a lot of people who feel like they don't have that space. And so when I sit down with someone, I'm not in problem solver mode. Yeah. That's, I'm not there. And, and even though part of my role is to help people solve their problems and there's a consultant side of what I do, 
The first thing is to come in with curiosity. I'm not reading what they've submitted and what their issue is and thinking about immediately about what what I'm going to offer as a solution, because I don't even know if what they wrote down is actually what the issue is yet. And I don't know what temperament or mood that, that they were in when they submitted that. So, so there, there are things like that that I don't think I would have as strong a grasp of, of applying ha- had I not learned some of the things that, that I've learned about coaching. And again, going back to the levels of listening and when you're listening on a, on a global scale and you're thinking about that. So that's another aspect of this too. When you're listening globally and you're thinking about what this client is sharing and then you're thinking about other clients who have shared similar things and you're mm-hmm. thinking about whatever geo, geopolitical tensions may be going on in the region. There could be things around uh, um, social order, other other constraints and things that are coming up. So So there is so much that can go into it that... I can't begin to form an opinion until I've listened and heard the person and learned a bit about them and had an opportunity to ask questions and clarify to make sure that we're talking about the right thing. It's beautifully said. We've had um, our past season was leading through crisis, chaos and change. And then last year we had a season called bringing humanity into the workplace. And everything you just shared feels like you can plug that in to those two topics, just like it's the ROI of coaching in the workplace. In this moment in time on planet Earth, humans feel more unbelonged than ever and need to feel belonged more than ever. And we have a technology in coaching that if organizations, which are super impactful and powerful around the world, can train their people managers in, can have folks like yourself internally in roles where they're offering this modality, it can really help. It's not the um, only part of the solution. I'm sorry, it's it's one part of the solution. It's not the whole solution, but we can really create more belonging. And we, I think people are just literally dying to be seen. And the nature of the workforce over specifically the past four years with the unprecedented amount of change and crisis and chaos more so than ever, it's like slowing down. And you referred to listening multiple times, like teach our managers and teacher, teach everybody in an organization how to listen deeply and feel the ripple effect of that, like inside your organization with engagement, with business results, and then the ripple effect with these folks when they go home to their roommates, their families, their partners, their communities, right? That's that's what's possible here if more organizations choose to make this investment. Right. Retention. People stay, people want to stay where they feel like they belong, where they feel like they're seen, they feel like they're heard. Yes. Yes. And organizations, you know, they're losing people at an unprecedented rate too, because of everything we just said. So here's one way to combat that. So I, we, we've heard how you got into coaching, but if you look back and it, it might be after you got into coaching, I'm really curious about an experience you had with a coach, whether it was a formal coaching relationship or a leader that was coach-like. What's the story you can share about the impact an individual had that was coach-like? I would speak about my leadership coach, Kayvon, who we both know and who's probably been on as as well. We love you, Kayvon. (laughs) Shout out to Kayvon. Yes, yes, we do. I actually have my weekly session with him a little bit later today. So also also perfectly well-timed. Perfectly. But the answer I'm going to go with for this one is a previous manager Her name is Jen. And I worked for her from 2019 till 2021-ish, maybe a little bit longer than that. And I think of her because one, she was one of the most empathetic people that I knew or one of the most empathetic people that I've known. Very, very high EQ as, as a leader, as a human. She saw me go through some really difficult times, like mental, emotional breakdown type stuff, just being in a in a really rough spot. And she knew toward the end of our time working together that I wasn't fully fulfilled by the role. 
And I wanted to stay in that role because I wanted to get a higher performance rating and prove to the other leads and managers that I was better than consistently meets expectations. And so there was an ego part of that that I didn't recognize at first. So even though I didn't enjoy the work, even though I didn't feel like I was using my skills and capabilities to my best, I wanted to stay in that role to try and get a higher performance rating before I thought about transitioning to another team. And she asked me a question that I now ask people quite often, but in my own words. And she said, would you rather stay in a role that you don't enjoy and fight to get a rating for people who ultimately don't matter? She didn't say that part, but that's, that was kind of the interpretation of it. Yeah. Or would you rather move into a role where you're using the skills you enjoy? For example, you said that you feel like whenever you talk to people, they walk away feeling better. So, and so, and so why would you not lean into roles that might give you that, uh, that opportunity? And I had to pause and think about it. And then as I was, pa- as I was paused, she said, and you might even get promoted faster because you actually enjoy the work and you're leaning into what you're already good at. And I had mm-hmm. never thought about it that way. Mm-hmm. And when she put it like that, I just, she, she got quiet. And then I sat there and I thought about it. And eventually I said, yeah, you're right. And then she recommended the role to me that I'm in today. Wow. So the reason this- I ended up changing teams wow. and it turned out to be a perfect fit role. It leaned into the, the coaching. It leaned into uh, being able to help people, being able to raise morale. It, it leaned into a, a lot of the things that I was really passionate about and interested in. And while she made the suggestion, that choice was mine. And that's, and that's the thing about it. Like she made, she didn't just say, Hey, I was thinking you might be interested in this role. We had a whole conversation about the way that I was thinking about my career development. And she asked that question that kind of changed everything. And it made me, it also made me realize like, wow, I'm really, I'm really doing something that I don't really want to do to prove something (laughs) to people who in a few years time, like in the grand scheme of my life, like there, it, no, no significance. Like this has no significance. Why, why would I choose to continue to expend the amount of emotional energy that I'm expending when I could do something uh, that would be more energizing, more, more recharging, more aligned to who I am. And this role that I'm in now is the most values aligned role that I've ever been in. Now I will say this, I was not prepared for how emotionally challenging and taxing it would be because I'm dealing with humans on a one to one basis on a, on a, uh, every day. And sometimes I'm hearing unpleasant things from these folks. And so carrying that weight and I have people come to me in tears, all different types of situations. And so carrying that is, is a lot, but I do find that sometimes the things that are most aligned and the things that do give us the most satisfaction are difficult. They're not, it's not just go in, have an easy career conversation. And then every conversation is just a happy go lucky conversation. And even I find I've even found in this role that some of the conversations just there would, I'd have days where I dreaded talking to people, but then once I actually had the conversations with folks, I'd be like, I'd be like, Oh, Okay. Like I, I got actually feel energized, you know, and that's not every conversation, but again, this all goes back to that, that conversation with Jen. And I actually, I invited her to my upcoming wedding <laughs> because she's been so impactful in my life. Uh, and it's like, I just, I just will never forget that. And what that's, what that conversation did for me and what that conversation continues to do for me. Mm. So shout out to Jen. And shout then out all, to Jen. Shout out to Jen and all the the people managers that have some of these qualities, right? That, that Jen embodies and what, I mean, there's a lot in there, but I'm going to pull it a few. So for folks who are listening, who are developing their coaching capabilities and their leadership, uh, and again, and or listening from a place of, should I bring this technology into my organization? Jen um, asked some powerful questions. She made distinctions. You know, it's a big part of coaching is helping, um, people to get clear on what am I saying yes to? What am I saying no to? She's also, sounds like she also held your agenda. So yes, as a people manager, as a business leader, she's got an agenda, 
But she also knew that if she's holding your agenda, the organization is going to get more out of you. The company's going to get more out of you. If you're in a role that's aligned to your values, you know, that feels mission driven, that it's uh, leveraging your strengths. And so let's like, again, shout out to Jen and more, more of those types of leaders. Like that is what our world needs, Rich. Like I so believe that. And yeah. you know, it's one of the reasons why we're having these conversations. Yeah. And I've got to say, there are, one thing I've noticed is that there are a lot of people managers who are people managers. Their primary goal is the progression of their career. It's not the development of their people. Yes. They're people managing because that's the next step of to them get becoming a director or then becoming a VP yes. or then becoming something else. And so they actually... They focus on getting the work. Yes, that, that's the primary thing. You want to get the core, you want to get the core work done. But because they're so wrapped up in their own stuff, that, like how can they be listen? How can they truly be listening if they're thinking about themselves and all of the other stuff that they that they have going on? So they've signed up for the the work part of it, but they haven't necessarily signed up for the the people part of it. Yes. And this is like what we're on a mission <laughs> to do. Because if we if we bring the people part with the tactical part, if we bring the relationship part with the results part, then we have more wholeness in our workplaces, right? And then, you know, brass tacks, we know it leads to engagement. We know it leads to um, better innovation and production of the outcomes of the work. And then it creates the sustainable workforce that energizes humanity versus people are feeling like robots, you know, and they're feeling unbelonged. And then we know that that impacts people's mental health, physical well-being, right? So there's such a responsibility in this moment in time for companies and organizations and leaders to embrace that there's a whole human working with them. Rich, tell us a little bit, a little bit more about you because you you have a very interesting and like you've been on such a journey. Tell us a little bit about like, it, and this is going to be hard to bottom line this, but like, what are some bullet points that's got you to this moment in time? Some bullet points. I love the way you asked that. That helps me to, to focus it. <laughs> Bullet points. One, I made the decision to quit alcohol July 1st, 2020 during the pandemic. That And that was something that I had struggled with for years, quietly in the background. So outwardly successful, quietly struggling. I mentioned Jen seeing me in bad times. One of those bad times was alcohol related. But making that decision was the beginning of the physical healing. Yeah. And yeah. One year later, when I celebrated one year free from alcohol, I realized, I'm like, man, I'm feeling pretty good. I think I think I can get back in the track and field. And it's in track and getting back in the track is something that I thought about pretty much every day for probably, well, last time I completed was probably 16 years ago prior to getting back into it. And I realized that at the, at the one year point that I finally had the physical space to achieve this goal of getting back in the track and to getting back in the track and field. The other thing that was critical was the decision to take a mental health leave from my day job in September of 2021. Wow. So I started training for track and field, thought everything was wonderful, but then work got really difficult. I couldn't do basic tasks, things like putting stuff on the calendar, following up on email. I had a, a, a couple of panic attacks, things like that. So I ended up having to take or deciding to take a mental health leave from work. And I, and I was against that at first. I was all the, what will people think about me? I hadn't been on the team that long. But what I saw was my lead at the time, they went out on leave and someone else on the team had went out on leave. And I remember saying, if they can create that type of space for themselves, why can't I create that type of space for me? Yeah. And so I went out on that leave and that, and so that leave was actually the beginning of the mental and emotional healing. And I, I can say that because on that leave, I had learned, I learned that I lived with complex PTSD for most of my life and didn't know it as a result of earlier life and childhood experiences. I 
learned more about the ADHD symptoms that were going on. And I won't go too far into this, but complex PTSD and ADHD share some things in common in terms of how they, in terms of how they impact executive function. Uh, a lot of us are walking around frustrated with our ability to get things done and not realizing that there's actually something going on beneath that we need to look more into. And so going on leave was in, was one of the best decisions that I've made next to quitting, quitting alcohol. The third bullet point, or maybe it's the fourth bullet point, is that when I went back to work, I decided beforehand that I never want to feel the way that I felt when I went on leave. Mm. And I thought to myself, what can I do to ensure that that never happens again? And that's when I became really rigid and intentional about my boundaries. Mm. And interestingly, Having boundaries has created opportunities for me at work because people say, wow, like you really like, wait, you're not going to lean into that opportunity. Like that would be great. I'm like, yeah, I like my life right now. Yes. Like I like I've turned like I've turned stuff down and people have commented on that. And even being becoming a wellness coach after I went back to work because I'd seen the value. I'm like, man, this wellness and this health and wellness, like this is the stuff that's that, that's really important. Like, like this is the stuff that that people need to be focusing on. And I became a certified wellness coach. And then I started hosting a podcast at work on health and wellness. And then I started getting internal speaking op opportunities related to health and wellness. And what's wild about this to me is that I didn't campaign for any of these things. All I did was walk in alignment. And the, and the opportunities started coming my way and they continue to come my way. And then the last thing I'll say, as far as track and field, I became a national champion in my first year back <laughs> in the okay. long jump and in, in the triple jump for my age group. And then I became a national champion for the second time, this time in the long jump. And it was a day after I turned 40. Oh my goodness, Rich. And so <laughs> it is, it's, it's wild. And even like the, the sports thing, I, I was feeling like time was running out. I was like, oh, my body's going to break down, blah, blah, blah. But now where I am now, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, man, I'm, j I'm just getting started. I'm just like, this is, going. this is fun. This is fun. But sometimes it takes, it also took seeing people older than me in the type of shape that I wanted to be in. So when I went to this national championship, me and I'm 40, I'm going to be 41 in a few days. But when I saw 60, 65 year old men running faster, looking more shredded, more flexible, I was, I was, I was like, man. I've had it all wrong as far as how this goes. And I, and I know why I've seen things that way. And it's because of what I saw growing up, like men, black men dying earlier. My dad had a bunch of health issues. I had a grandfather who had health issues. And so to me, it was, man, like we die early, like we fall apart, like everything. But I and seeing other people. And that's a lot of us. We don't sometimes get to see that, it, that example. It not only inspired me to keep going, but it, it also inspired me to, to rethink how I look at like my capabilities and even how I look at health and wellness and, and most importantly, how I look at what's possible. So it's been a, a wild journey. The finding balance is very much a part of what I'm constantly doing because there's so much, um, there's been so much that's been on my plate, but I've also accepted like I'm a high performer. I'm always going to be involved in multiple things. I'm always going to want to do things at a high level. And now it's more about, I'm constantly figuring out how do I create more space? That's my thing yeah. is how do I, is how do I create more space for myself? And that's something that I'm constantly focusing on day by day, my calendar everywhere. And I, and I mean, even being at this point of being engaged, like it's no coincidence that I got engaged a year, December, 2022. Yeah. And even to get to that point, that required me to go through the healing. Yes, I mentioned that mental health leave was the beginning of the the emotional yeah. healing journey, and I don't and I don't know if I could have gotten to that when I did with as much confidence as I had without having healed the amount that I did. And, and I don't believe that I'm completely healed. Healing is a forever yeah. journey, for sure. Definitely and a forever journey, and it's a spiral, right? <laughs> it's and, a spiral, and, and, and it's and it's a spiral. But I I, I think my perspective has changed so much over these past few years. And I feel this is probably the one of the point, no, the one point where I feel like, like I'm doing things I want to be doing. I'm not doing things because of anyone else. I'm not trying to impress anyone. I'm, I'm not trying to make some point. I'm focusing on what's most important to me, understanding what the sacrifices may be 
on the, the back end, but I'm I'm comfortable with that. Mm. So this is oh, there's so much in that. And thank you for sharing all of it. Um yeah, I've been on the pref- peripheral observing this unfolding of Rich Jones. And it's cool to hear some of the bullet points that were catalysts, right? Um, You are an inspiration. You are an inspiration, Rich Jones. And you are really a living, breathing example, embodiment of this work that we get to do, right? That we get to do together, that we get to do in the workplace, that we get to do in our communities. And watching you... um, make your mess, your message or make your, it's like our mess becomes our mission, right? Like this is what, this is what I'm hearing. And just watching you be an example of that. um, It's like more, please, like more, more of that in the world. And I think, you know, the way you are showing up in the workplace and external from the workplace is helping other people say, you know what, maybe I can too. You know, maybe I can too. That's the, that, that, that's the goal. That's the goal. I talk about like my approach to social media and things like that. I talk a lot about myself. I don't take the traditional, I've got to be an expert. I've got to make sure people know that I talk about careers and wellness. I talk about my life one, because that feels most authentic, but two, I know that there are people who've gone through similar things or who are, who are going through similar things and who are at a similar place, especially in the millennial generation, because we ain't the youth no more. Yeah. Now we're the VPs, the, we're becoming the CEOs. We've got families. We life is life. We've got elder family members that we're, that we're now taking care of. So there's a lot of different stuff there. And I just want people to see that it is possible and that you can walk in alignment and that you don't have to do all these other things that people say that, that you need to do to be successful. And then also I love that people know that like my definition of success, it isn't like just, you know, climbing the ladder at work. It's not even, you know, just track and field, but it's, it's about being able to do the things that I want to do and being able to share those things in, in, and even when I'm not, when I'm going through bad, like I, I share that too. Like I share everything like, Hey, like I'm, I, you know, when I had to cut back on task, I felt like I was failing. Yeah. That was a very real thing. I even, even yeah. though rationally, yeah. I knew that. It was the best decision. It created more space. It was aligned. The emotional part of me felt like I was failing. And so I'll share things like, like that too. And I just feel like that's, that's my thing is walk the talk. It may be a slow path of growth because I'm not following the, the script or the agenda in terms of how you're supposed to do this, but it's an authentic path to growth. And that's what's going to have to work for me. Woo. I'll be out here. Yeah. (laughs) So with that, what would you say is the ROI of coaching in the workplace? Let's, let's bring this baby to a close. What would you say? Um, The RO, the ROI overall on the business side, one, we talked about retention. Also, we didn't talk as much about this, but getting more out of your people and not in a just capitalistic type of way, but when you have people doing the the work that interests them, the work that they're aligned to, the work that they feel good about, there's going to be a direct benefit to that. And also you're going to get more out of your people if they feel seen. How can someone deliver their best work if they feel invisible? It, it's just not possible. How can someone get the recognition to, to even have that next step if if, if they feel invisible. So it's, it's, yes, it's, it's much more on the human level in some ways in terms of how clear it is versus the bottom line, but it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. And you don't want to wait until you've got primarily negative sentiment to start addressing this when you could proactively create a coaching culture and have your managers, have your staff, have employees just even learn to coach each other and you could do something like that now. And then you're building a really self-sufficient organization. Oh, that's my prayer too. What you just said, just like, can we, can we even get just a little bit of this in every, 